It's been 20 years now since the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, which killed 3,000 Americans, saw the World Trade Centers collapse, the Pentagon on fire, and another plane lost. A violent tragedy, which was used as a pretext to start not just a war in Afghanistan, but an entire war on terror, spanning multiple continents, killing scores of innocents and displacing millions. Almost 20 years to the day, the United States has finally left Afghanistan. While the media fixates obsessively over the withdrawal, what about the war itself? If America started an entire war in order to fight terrorism, shouldn't we be asking whether it worked? Did the United States actually defeat terrorism or did it make it worse? What could possibly justify occupying another country for 20 years, killing hundreds of thousands and displacing millions more? This is what we should be asking. It's the only sensible, rational thing to do. But no one seems to be asking the question, so we will. I'm Richard Medhurst and you're watching The Communique. It's been 20 years now since the attacks of September the 11th, a tragic event that left 3,000 Americans dead and the world in shock. What was at first an awful terrorist attack was soon to become the catalyst for war. U.S. President George Bush, along with his British counterpart Tony Blair, used the pretext of 9-11 to attack and invade Afghanistan, which they called the War on Terror. Now, of course, in 2021, they try to justify the invasion by saying, oh, it was good for women's rights and we were nation building and oh, democracy. <laughs> but back then, these terms weren't even heard of. The phrase nation building or women's rights wasn't in the conversation in 2001. Back then, what they said was we have to go to Afghanistan and get bin Laden and get Al Qaeda and get the Taliban because they sheltered bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And to do this, the US Congress passed something called the AUMF of 2001, the authorization for the use of military force. Now, the AUMF doesn't even specifically mention Afghanistan or Al Qaeda or bin Laden or the Taliban. The AUMF only refers to those who attacked America or helped attack America on 9 11. It's one and a half pages long and extremely vague. It talks about an abstract, undefined enemy whose name we don't know. We don't know where they live. They use these broad blanket terms on purpose. You know, just conveniently, it's an abstract enemy, an open ended war that can't be finished, just like the war on drugs. And every single person in Congress voted for this, barely a week after 9-11, with the exception of Barbara Lee. And so after 9-11 happened, the Taliban actually offered to hand over bin Laden. They told the US, here, we'll, we'll give bin Laden to a third country, if you can prove that he's guilty first, which is basic rule of law. It's a minimum requirement for an extradition. But the US said no, they refused multiple times. So what does that tell you about their intentions? I mean, if you're gonna go to war because you're so sure that it was bin Laden, then surely you can prove that he's guilty, right? That should be easy. If you can occupy Afghanistan for years, then you can surely make the effort to extradite him. But they didn't. They were clearly adamant to just go in and bomb Afghanistan and occupy it. This was a chance to avoid war and Bush did not take it. And just one month after the invasion, Tony Blair claimed Al Qaeda was destroyed. All the infrastructure was gone. Okay, well, if the goal of the war on terror was to defeat Al Qaeda, then why did you stay for 20 years? This shows you that they are occupiers. Either Tony Blair was lying, or for once, he was being honest and admitting that they were staying in Afghanistan for very different reasons than just going after Al Qaeda. Because after they got rid of Al Qaeda, now all of a sudden the enemy is the Taliban. And it's not just the Taliban, oh, they have to stay for nation building and women's rights and you name it. They find every reason under the sun to justify imperialism. And one of the real reasons that they stayed in Afghanistan, besides making money, was that they wanted a military presence at Iran and China's doorsteps. Now all of a sudden, Iran has US bases to the east on its border with Afghanistan. It's got US bases to the north, and then US bases in the west after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Very practical, right? To have American bases on Iran's border and China's border without actually invading them, but just close enough to intimidate them. Now, if we talk about the war on terror, there's one important question to ask. How successful was this war on terror? If the goal was to defeat terrorism, well, then it was a failure, a disaster. Because ever since they started the war on terror, there have been more suicide attacks, more terrorism, 
And not just more in general, but there are more people dying from these terrorist attacks. And where are these people dying? In the countries where America claims it is fighting terrorism. I mean, either America is helping fuel the rise of terrorism, or it is so incompetent and dangerous that it is inadvertently causing more terrorism. And either way, the conclusion, the logical conclusion from this is that you should not be invading other people's countries. It is undeniable. The West invading other countries is not a force for good in the world. It is making the world more dangerous. Before the invasion in 2001, Al-Qaeda was supposedly just confined to Afghanistan. Well, now you apparently have Al-Qaeda in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And now you have different flavors of Daesh. But instead of admitting this, and asking the hard questions, the media is just turning around and burying its head in the sand and focusing on the withdrawal. And even during the pullout by US troops, what happens? A terrorist attack. 170 people tragically killed at Kabul airport. I mean, nothing is more emblematic of what a failure this entire campaign has been. And this isn't something just confined to Afghanistan, as they went and implicated Iraq into this mess with this absurd lie about Saddam Hussein having links to Al-Qaeda, even claiming that he wanted to give Al-Qaeda nuclear weapons. So after they invaded Afghanistan under this pretext of fighting terrorism, then they invaded Iraq, even though both these countries had nothing to do with 9-11. All that was necessary was to seemingly claim a link to Al-Qaeda. That's all they had to do. And that's why the AUMF has been used in at least 19 countries to bomb 19 countries. And this hasn't just happened under Bush, this is something that has been pursued by every president. Obama massively expanded the US drone strike program. Under Trump, airstrikes increased by 432%. Just this month, a drone strike ordered by President Biden killed an entire family in Afghanistan. And now you have all these people dying from terrorism, from new variants of Al-Qaeda, of Daesh, all these attacks on the rise. And those, those people who weren't killed by the terrorists were killed by the Americans, by the coalition of the willing, by state terrorism. And if you look at Afghanistan, 50,000 dead. And that's a conservative estimate. Pakistan, where the war spilled over to, lost masses of people because of US drone strikes. And then the figure is really in the hundreds of thousands. But it doesn't end there. One million Iraqis dead, not to mention the millions of refugees, half of Syria's population displaced. You know, 3,000 people died on 9-11. How many 9-11s has Afghanistan had? How many 9-11s has Iraq had? How many 9-11s have Pakistan, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, how many have they had? Or are you going to come here and tell me that 3,000 Americans are worth more than millions of Arabs and Muslims? Are you telling me that it's okay to kill millions of Muslims and Arabs to avenge 3,000 Americans? Without a doubt, the real victims of the war on terror are surely those whose countries were invaded. Joining me is British political activist Chris Nynam. He is a founding member of the Stop the War Coalition an advocacy group for peace and against interventionism. Chris was one of the organizers of the protest on 15th of February 2003 where masses of people poured into the streets voicing their opposition against the invasion of Iraq. It has been claimed as the largest public demonstration in British history. He also served under former Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn. So Chris, you know, it's the 20th anniversary. We're 20 years on now from 9-11. Uh, we've had the war on terror, so much conflict. Could I just get your thoughts very briefly on this 20th anniversary of this terrible attack and everything that's happened uh, since then? I think both the attack itself, uh, which was a tragedy, and the, um, the response from the West have been uh, absolutely catastrophic. I mean, the world has changed in the last 20 years uh, very, very profoundly. Um, and that's mainly because the kind of response to 9-11 that was uh, charted by the US administration uh, under Bush has been catastrophically bad. The whole idea of invading a country in order to liberate it, to change it, to bring progress is a completely faulty one. It's been, a, in terms of particularly Western foreign policy, it's been an absolutely catastrophic 20 years. One of the things that I remember from when I was a kid, uh, and, and this has always stayed in my memory, is uh, the February 15th protest. You know, seeing millions of people from around the world, uh, as you just mentioned, and especially in the UK, flooding the streets. If I'm not mistaken, you helped organize this protest, right? And so I wanted to ask you, I mean, what does it take to sustain a movement like that to keep 
a sentiment of anti-war, anti-imperialism going in the public? And how important is it to have public opinion against the wars in the first place? There were a number of different elements to, to, to building the movement. Um, first of all, it was uh, trying to establish the broadest possible kind of coalition of forces, uh, which meant getting obviously people from the left, campaigning hard to get the unions on board, which is something we managed to do, some of the trade, most of the trade unions in Britain, starting with the more militant unions, but gradually kind of um, uh, pushing outwards from that base. Crucially, the Muslim communities in Britain, um, we approached, sometimes they approached us. Um, we worked very, very closely together with them, and that was very important um, in terms of even the first demonstration in November, in uh, November 2001, there was a large number of people from, you know, the, the Muslim communities in Britain on the demonstration, which was which was a very very powerful um, statement. I think it had a big effect on people. You recently wrote an article, I think, in the Morning Star about the 20 year anniversary of 9/11, and you mentioned that quote supporters of the invasion claim that there were advances in the country under occupation, but that the facts suggest otherwise. Can you give us some examples of that? Well, I mean, the two things that are commonly said by um, defenders of the war, apologists for the war in Afghanistan, are that uh, there was a health service that was built up that was, you know, a massive improvement, and B, that women's lives have improved. Um, and I think really, fundamentally, neither thing is true. I mean, Afghanistan spends 0.6% of, of its GDP on health, which is one of the lowest percentages anywhere in the world and stands against a, an average in South Asia of 5%. So, I mean, health provision is absolutely diabolical in the country, that's the truth. Uh, and secondly, on the, on the issue of, of advances for women, I think there were some advances for women in um, more middle-class or elite circles in the cities, but in general, life for women in Afghanistan has been as bad, if not worse, as it, uh, as it has for everyone else. I mean, 240,000 people have been killed by the war, um, just, you know, to, to, to start with. But also the, de the devastation of the infrastructure, the general violence and lawlessness in the country, um, all of these things have impacted massively on women's lives. And actually, if you look at the stats, the uh, levels of literacy for women in Afghanistan are the worst anywhere in the world. Only 18% of women of uh, uh, of women in Afghanistan are literate at, at this point after this so-called progress. So uh, I, I think, unfortunately, this is war propaganda. Um, it was used at the time of the launch of the war, and it's now being used to desperately try and justify the unjustifiable uh, and to try and pretend that what ha what has happened in Afghanistan was anything other than a an absolute disaster. So, you know, I don't think we should. I don't think we should. Uh, we should allow the, um, the 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 people who support the war to get away with this kind of nonsense. They also talk about economic progress. Look at the World Bank statistics. Look at the UN statistics. There has been no economic progress in Afghanistan in the last twenty years. In fact, most indexes suggest that it's gone backwards, which is not surprising because that's what happens when you bombard a country with, um, you know, with a, a huge amount of, uh, of munitions and send troops rampaging through the streets of towns and cities. You know, this isn't uh, a particularly sensible economic strategy. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short break. But even the average American, they've also lost in this war, and not only because the politicians use them like cannon fodder, sending them off to die or get their legs blown off in exchange for some metal. On average, there are 22 veterans committing suicide every day. Something clearly wrong going on here. And the irony in all of this is that Americans who thought they were delivering democracy and freedom to others lost their own freedom and democracy. Under their very noses, US politicians were passing things like the Patriot Act, warrantless wiretapping, or the president's surveillance program signed barely 24 hours after 9-11 by then Vice President Dick Cheney. They started a mass surveillance program to spy on you in the name of fighting terrorism. And it doesn't stop there, just look at Guantanamo Bay. One of the most horrific consequences of the war on terror is without a doubt, Guantanamo Bay. The Bush administration set up this prison on occupied Cuban territory 
and has used it to kidnap Muslim men from around the world, bring them there and hold them without charge or trial. One of the men who was taken to Guantanamo Bay is Mansour al-Daifi from Yemen. He was never charged with any crime, never mind convicted of a crime. An innocent man, he was kept in Guantanamo Bay for 14 years and only freed recently in 2016. Now he is an activist and a CAGE Guantanamo project coordinator. He's also just released a book titled Don't Forget Us Here, detailing his time in Guantanamo. Hello, Mansour. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, Mansour, it, you know, for, for those who are not familiar with your story, with what you had to endure, um, could you tell us who you are, what you did before you were uh, detained and taken to Guantanamo Bay and, and how you ended up being there? Uh, I am Mansour Daifi. Now I am holding also a uh, number 441 because also this is my uh, number. I, I think I own it. I pay 15 uh, years for it. Uh, I am from Yemen, where I was, uh, as you know, like I lived for around uh, 18 years. I, I grew up in, uh, was in a very conservative family. I finished my high school uh, in Yemen. Then I went to Afghanistan for a research mission. Only after a few months, I was uh, pushed by world lord, sold to the um, CIA for bounty, mini, uh, bounty money, uh, imprisoned in the black site, then shipped uh, to Guantanamo. So a warlord just wanted some money from the CIA? As you know, when, when, when the American invaded uh, Afghanistan in 2001, they were throwing flyers offering large bounty of money for anyone who, who hand, hand over foreigners or Afghanis. So according to the ACLU, that 86% of the 20s at Guantanamo were either mistaken identity or sold for bounty. People think that people in Guantanamo, they were captured in the battlefield. No, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. Now only... The research proved that only 8% 8 per, 8 per, 8 who has ties to Al-Qaeda or Taliban. Right. So that, that's out of several hundred, right? Out of 800. I mean, the United States wanted to send a, wanted, wanted to send a message to, to the world. They can go beyond any laws. They won't, they won't abide by any law or uh, uh, agreements. So they created Guantanamo outside of the law. Baseless legal uh, place. Also, at the same time, it, it, Guantanamo is a military prison within a, a military base. It's like a black hole. So they said federal law doesn't apply in Guantanamo. Cobia uh, law doesn't apply. Geneva Confession doesn't, law, doesn't apply. So it's outside uh, of the law. So they can do whatever they want. There is no account. There was. There is no accountability for what happened there. The youngest detainee was only a few months old. The oldest was 105 years old. To that extent. What, what's the, the one common denominator between everyone who's detained there? You're, you're just Muslim. Yeah, I mean, yes, like all of us were Muslims. Like, as I told you, 50 nationalities, uh, 20 years spoken, all of us were Muslims. At that time, General uh, Jeffrey Miller arrived and he started uh, developing what they call enhanced interrogation technique or enhanced torture technique. Torture. Yeah. So they started like applying. Uh, sleep deprivation, beating, loud music, raping, sexual assault, uh, solitary confinement, uh, all kind of methods. Because they, they, they used to take the Holy Quran, put it on their feet, pee on it, uh, throw what? it on the, the ground. Yeah, the integrators, yes. Stopping us from praying, mocking us. I remember when I, when I used to pray, they would, uh, they would throw us the uh, Israeli flag or the American flag. Sometimes there was like we call it the satanic room where they like they have a room and dark room where they put candles and the floor is like uh, satanic uh, stars and signs. What? It, 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 like as it is crazy. I told you Guantanamo was an experimenting lab. So let us finish the story. When James Yee tried to protest and tried to protest the torture in the in the detention himself was accused of spinach, was accused of uh, sympathy with detainees. He was detained, he was detained, arrested and detained and interrogated. He was put in the orange jumpsuit and shackles and hooded and a fly back to the United States. This is American Muslim, not getting anyone, a captain in the, America, in the American army. To the extent, imagine if they have done this with their own soldier, the one who came to serve his own country. What about us? They view us the worst of the worst terrorists. 
they, they view us as like who people who are responsible for 9-11. So when General Miller arrived in 2003, when they found out the majority of the detainees, they have no ties with the Al-Qaeda, I mean, even the, the Rumsfeld. He said most of the detainees at Guantanamo there are dirt farmers, totally disconnected from the world. When we arrived there, I mean, we were we had no clue where we were or what's going to happen to us. We asked interrogators what I have done. And uh, they couldn't answer us. This is what I wanted to ask you. Did any of the guards uh, or staff, uh, you know, or the people who are holding you captive, did they show mercy at, at any moment? And what happened uh, as a result of that, if they did? You know, Richard, you will be surprised. <laughs> When they, before they brought the guard to Guantanamo, the soldiers, they, they used to take them to uh, New York with the, to the, uh, where the two, two towers collapsed. Ground zero, yeah. To, and tell them the, the people who are responsible for that are being detained at Guantanamo. Imagine those guards, so what happened when they came to Guantanamo, they fell of hate and grudge, but, those guards would love for us at least for six months or one year. So you cannot fool them all the time. You know, in, in the military, they try to program their mind to control them, to fit them with hate. And some of them honestly came to apologize to us. Some of them actually convert to Islam. Last night, we had an event, one of the two former Guantanamo guards, both of them convert to Islam, alhamdulillah. And the other many stories. There were also doctors, there were nurses, there were some kind of staff who sympathized with that. They understood. But again, they're in the military. Given everything that you've just told me, everything you went through in Guantanamo Bay, uh, everything that's happened in the last 20 years, what do you have to say about the United States' war on terror or war of terror? Of course, you know, it was a tragedy and there were like uh, innocent uh, killed there. And, but what about the victims? Almost like around 1 million Muslim killed uh, around the world, uh, almost like over 35 million displaced and hundreds of thousands tortured, abused, and imprisoned. So also those victims. So United States actually after 9-11, they produced their own 9-11 in every country. And I don't, honestly, I don't think those victims or families of 9-11 would agree to that policy. I don't think punishing the wrong people for what happened, I don't agree with that. Because, you know, vengeance in the wrong place, is, I don't think they, they would allow even uh, the misuse of, of that tragedy to, to, uh, to go to the extent. But what we have seen, as, as you know, uh, uh, it, it just, who benefit from that war on terror? Agencies, countries, uh, individuals. Mansour al thank you so much for your time. Really, I'm so grateful. Stories like Mansour's are the important ones. They're the ones America doesn't want the world to hear, and indeed, the most heartbreaking ones. And not a single US official has ever been prosecuted for any of these wars and war crimes in the last 20th century. What was this all for? The US even spent 20 years saying it's fighting the Taliban. The Taliban are right back in power now, almost 20 years to the day. And in their interim government, we even find Guantanamo Bay ex-detainees. One minister even has a bounty on his head. All this time, the West has been saying it's fighting terrorism and killing terrorists, but they've actually just been killing civilians. The real terrorists were never caught or prosecuted or killed. The real terrorists were in Washington, D.C. The terrorists were in Whitehall planning the wars. 20 years, and what did they accomplish? What did this war on terror accomplish? So many people dead, so many people wounded, so many refugees. Who mourns for those victims? I ask you, where is the mourning and the grieving process for them? 9-11 was used as a pretext by corrupt politicians and corporatists to expand their empire and their profits. So yes, absolutely, mourn the 3,000 Americans, but mourn the others too, those that were killed and forgotten, those that are being killed right now, that are maimed right now, that are living under military occupation right now. The Arab and Muslim world has not even begun to recover from the fallout of 9-11 and America's response. This tragedy on 9-11 has been exploited to carry out some of the worst atrocities and war crimes and acts of terrorism because invading others and killing them, that's terrorism. That is true terrorism. And that's what we've been living through, that's what we've been seeing, and it's still going to continue if people don't wake up and see the truth. That the war on terror has always been the war of terror. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Richard Medhurst and this is 
the communique.